Hi, my name is Christopher Anatra. I am the president and CEO of NECS Incorporated, the developers of Entree Software. What I'm doing today is I'm sitting down talking with Kit Moore and Ken Yuntz um, that have a lot of information about both uh, GS1 information, which a lot of my clients are very interested in, as well as something really interesting, a connection that I had made from, from talking to Kit, especially about how he used to work at a company called SPS, which was a developer of DSR software that ran on laptops that a lot of people use. A lot of my clients knew about that. So what I want to do first is I'm going to turn things over to Kit. And if Kit, if you can give, give everyone a little introduction about who you are, where you've been, and what, what you're doing right now. Absolutely. Thanks, Chris. My name is Kit Moore. I'm Vice President of Sales here at Atrobytes. Um, and my history actually started in the food service industry. My, my first real job out of college, uh, Ken Yance hired me um, to work for, for SPS. Um, at the time, the company did a laptop system, the very first laptop system in food service, uh, and also maintained a product information database that at the time was known as Profile. And that was really where my um, efforts started uh, under Ken's leadership. Um, that organization uh, was sold, uh, gosh, I think around 2005. Um, and at that time, I got my first taste of the GDSN, uh, migrated over to another data pool known as FSE. Um, spent some time there. Um, got back into the client sales with another organization known as NCR. Um, spent some time also at One World Sync, another GDSN data pool, and, and uh, finally arrived here at Atrobytes. Uh, due to some previous relationships I'd earned uh, while at FSC with Mike Kavarik, who is our CEO. Uh, and Atrobytes is a GDSN data pool, um, but we also do some other things as well, uh, from document management to um, PIM solutions, product information management solutions, um, all the way to um, rebates, uh, price management, things of that nature. So it's been a great experience, um, always in the food service space, and um, really have enjoyed that time helping distributors really connect with their their manufacturers and bringing in good content. That's excellent. And while you're talking, I see something in the background: uh, food service distributor magazine cover. What's what's that? <laughs> well, interestingly, so um, SPS got a lot of notoriety. Um, back in the day, uh, because it was the very, very first laptop system. Um, kind of changed the industry as a whole, and so that was a, a magazine article that was written about city provisioners when they first launched uh, the company um, and launched the laptop system, which actually Ken was one of the guys at the company carrying that laptop. In fact, he might even have um, one of those old grid laptops that uh, started the whole system. Uh, another magazine article um, right here. This was an ID magazine. Uh, shows a few of the other players that were involved back in the day. Um, and one last bit of trivia, which I think is kind of interesting. A reason why a lot of this technology was developed, this is actually the ledger that they used at City Provisioners back in 1961 to kind of track sales, bookings, uh, things that they would purchase or sell to the operator. <laughs> wow. So uh, really come a long way uh, and, and why organizations like yourselves are so critical to the food service industry to help continue to, to bring technology and automation to, to many of those mundane activities that used to be done on paper before. Wow. We've, we've come a long way. Wow. So the other person that's going to be part of this conversation is Ken Yance. So Ken, tell us a little bit about yourself. And you got to tell us, are you in one of those photos that we just saw? No, I'm a behind the scenes guy, Chris. I stay out of the camera. So I, okay. uh, I actually was not there when those photos were taken. I came on about a year later uh, after, the, after the original rollout and all of that press. But I will tell you, all of those guys in those pictures still look exactly the same. But Larry's hair is a little, little different color, I think, than what it was <laughs> in that way. But uh, it was, uh, I, I, my background really started out in the restaurant industry. I spent a lot of my early years in the restaurant industry and was actually a customer of City Provisioners when those pictures were taken. 
And so uh, one day the salesman walked into my, uh, my restaurant with a, a big old briefcase and, and uh, this big black case and opened it up and had this portable computer inside of it, a portable printer. And took him about 10 minutes to set this thing up and turn it on and get it to work. And then he started showing me he had all my, my product list in there. And he said, you know, I could pick how many quantities I wanted to order. I could look up new items and so forth. So uh, he played with it for a couple minutes and then I finally took over the keyboard and, and I'm kind of a, a technology guy. So I, I was literally, you know, taken from the first time I put my hands on the keyboard of the SPS software. And about uh, six months later, got out of the restaurant business, went to work for city provisioners as a DSR and uh, carried my own laptop out on the street. Kit talked about the, the case. I actually have a picture. This is, this is the second generation of the, the laptop, but the, the first one was even bigger. But wow. this big old black case, that portable printer, paper, the laptop, and, and you had to have four battery packs to get through the day. The whole thing weighed about 30 pounds. So I always say you can, you can tell us original DSRs from the new guys because one arm is longer than the other from carrying that thing around all day. <laughs> oh my God. But uh, it was a great time. It was, it was a fun time to be uh, part of the industry. Larry Frank had a, he just had a vision and Larry and his brother Harvey owned city provisioners and they were second generation uh, owners of a family business. And Larry just had this vision that he could take this information that was in the IBM system 36 at that time and, and replicate it on a laptop and, and get it out in the field to the DSRs. And, you know, when you say that today, it sounds like, oh, okay. Not, not, a, not a big impressive feat, but uh, when you said it in the mid 1980s, it was uh, unheard of. And, and so it was, it was quite a vision. In fact, laptops in, uh, at the time the company started did not even have internal hard drives. And so uh, Larry and, and his team went out to California and, and met with uh, a company that was working on uh, that grid system laptop. It was an old Tandy Corporation. And the very first laptop with an internal hard drive rolled out at the same time as we launched SPS. It had a 10 megabyte hard drive. And uh, we, we thought, wow, 10 megabytes of space. <laughs> right. <laughs> so, uh, so that's how the whole story began. And, and then uh, they, they developed it for, for city provisioners. Joe Bendix was the president for city provisioners at the time. And Joe uh, was a, a brilliant guy, he wrote a business plan that said, hey, if this is good for us, it's good for the rest of the industry. So uh, they set it up as a separate company and, and uh, Mary, Mary broke off from the food distribution to run SPS and, and uh, took it to the market. And uh, it, was, uh, it was a lot of fun. Yeah, that's really interesting because I know when I, that's around the time when I first started NECS and was hearing about SPS all the time from, from my clients and potential clients. So you guys really had a big, a big part of food distribution history. And, and Kit, you were part of that too, right? You were, you were working at SPS. T tell us a little bit about that, your experience there. Well, in the early days, my, my primary objective was getting more manufacturers engaged in, in the profile database. So in, in, as Ken was kind of talking, the, the original grid laptop had 10 megs. Well, the next generation had 20 megs. And so there was all this extra space. And they're like, what are we going to do? So they started collecting product content and actually embedding it into the application. Um, in fact, th at that time it was called XBD, and this is the patent that they put on that, that uh, trademark for XBD, so expanded product information. And that was where my efforts were. I, I was working with all of the manufacturers. I would go to different trade shows, pop into the booths, uh, try to chat with the suppliers, explain to them that this is the way things are going to be going moving forward. All of this printed point of sale that you have here, we're going to take that and we're going to put it into the laptop system so when these sales reps are out in the field, they can address the questions of your operators and, and close that sale. Um, now, I was fortunate enough to continue to work with Ken and um, I got to graduate from working on just profiles and then eventually actually selling the laptop system and moving, you know, selling all of our products and you know as Ken moved into the presidency I got the opportunity to move into the vice presidency but it was a, a really fun time and um, really appreciated the, the opportunities to learn um, from Ken as well as the rest of the, the team there uh, about the food service industry and I still have a lot of those relationships today uh, so it's been a good time. Yeah, it's, it's really interesting like listening to you both 
about how that potential of getting, not just having the DSRs be able to easily enter orders and letting the, 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 the restaurant or chef enter their orders somewhat easily too, but there, you guys had the insight right from the beginning about how important it was to have all of that product information, right? That's so, that's so important. So I, I just want to mention that because I, I definitely agree with you and, and see where that's been and then where things are going to be going. So, so Ken, how did, and I know SPS was acquired at some point, I think in the, in the early 2000s, but what was the kind of the pattern, like what was SPS working on as things progressed through the 90s until it was acquired? Yeah, it was actually 2007 when, when we sold the company, but uh, it was, uh, you know, as to Kit's point, we, when we launched the company in, in 87, the original concept was Salesforce automation. We were going to put price books and pricing information and, and catalogs into a laptop instead of printing price books and all of the things that food service distributors used to have to do. As soon as the second generation laptop came out with that 20 megabyte hard drive, what Kit said was absolutely true. We, we had a conversation about 20 megabytes. Oh my gosh, what will we ever do with 20 megabytes of hard space? And so the idea came to, to what about that room full of POS material that we have? We've got all these flyers and brochures and used to call it, you know, trunk trash for the DSRs that, that never got to the point of sale and, and was never there when you needed it. And so we, we literally began to, to launch the database with a sales perspective, thinking we're going to take all that information, we're going to build it into a database. We called it XPD originally, uh, put it into a standardized format that we created. And then uh, a lot of the guys, if you have a lot of your old time DSRs will remember it as F7, because that was the key. You pushed F7 on the laptop to launch the product information. So it was, you know, here's your, my order guide, the customer needs a question, you press F7 and you got this additional information on, on, the, on the product. And so we, that morphed into a whole nother business model, obviously collecting and building that data, maintaining the database. And that's kind of, you know, where Kit came in and helped us a lot early on. But just gathering all that became a whole nother business model for us. And those were really our flagship products for most of the, the life of the company. And then, you know, as the company grew, we hired a lot more people and, and uh, we built a, a pretty solid business. We began to expand into some other products around those, but the core products were always automating the sales process and managing information in a standardized format. Those were our core flagship products. We had to rewrite the products and you can sympathize with this, I'm sure, Chris, as technology evolves, the original product was written in DOS. So mm -hmm. DOS went to Windows, Windows went to this 32-bit Windows 95, Windows 95 went to the software as a service, you know, that whole, that whole, uh, era continued to morph. And so we continued to invest heavily in the company. We were really fortunate. We, we built, we say we're a bunch of food service guys, but we just played in the technology aspect of the, of the industry. And so our whole platform grew from, you know, the, the, the DSR on the street telling us what they did and what they needed and how it needed to work. And then we, we gathered that information from our customers Similar to, I think, your business, Chris, your, your customers are one of your best assets, right? They, they tell you what their needs are, and then you're able to, to feed those needs through the use of technology. And we just had a great group of customers and, and a great group of employees that, that uh, you know, were held together for 20 years. And, uh, and most of them, many of them were with us that whole time. Some of them uh, left, but, but not many. And in fact, we've, it's 20, 2007 when we sold the company. But uh, we still have reunions. Everybody gets together occasionally. And uh, we still keep in touch. We have a little bit of a lotto pool that we all still kind of share in. <laughs> we haven't won anything yet, but we're all still hoping. Um, but anyway, it was, it was a great group of people. And, and so we evolved the product line. We got to a point in the, you know, early 2000 that, that it was just looking to make another major investment in the, in the technology rewrite. And uh, we ran into a company, AFS Technologies out of Phoenix, that had a very similar business model. They had very similar strategies. And they had already invested in, in some of the technology platforms. And so uh, that's where we sold. We, we felt like that was an opportunity for us to, to merge the businesses and, and uh, leverage the platform that they had already started on. But we rolled our, our Salesforce automation. And at that time, XPD had already morphed into Profile. 
and we rolled that into to their platform. And uh, Kit was kind of the profile king at that point. He, he ran that business for the AFS technologies after the merger. So, Gotcha. You know, one, one of the things you said too is that about how like the, the group at SPS, Sales Partner Systems, that they really cared, like they really did care about, their, about the clients and the DSRs that were using your product. I find the same thing with my crew here. Like the, the programmers that work here and the tech support staff, they really care. Like if somebody has a problem or a difficulty or comes up with a, something clever for us to implement into the software, they get pretty passionate about it. So I find that I agree with you there, like having a really good team. And, and I feel that in the future, kind of like what happened with, with, with you guys, like everyone stays together. It's almost like a family here. So you guys have, have had that family experience. And I'm wondering too, from, from either of you, at its peak, do you know how many DSRs we're using um, were on the SPS platform? Can you, That's I, a great question. I, you know, I, I probably could have told you that 10 years ago, but <laughs> I'm not sure I know now, Chris. I know at one point in time, we had 40% of the top 50 distributors in the ID magazine that were on our platform, not all using the Salesforce automation, but all using the, the product information for sure. Uh, we had uh, a pretty substantial market share for the first, you know, 10 years. And, and then, of course, competition came in and, and a few things. People started to write their own software. But uh, I, I don't know that number today, but it was it was quite a bit. I know there was some pretty substantial amount of business going through our platform. Yeah, 30,000 is hitting my, my, num my head. I don't know. Like, does that ring a bell with you, Ken, around 30,000? I, I, I remember that. 40% market share, and we did those statistics a lot back then, but. Um, yeah, I, I remember the 30,000 number. I, you know, I don't remember where that was. I know that was DSR level. You know, we also had what we call our VAS link or value added service program, which was the customer direct model. And that was, you know, over 100,000. So uh, it, was, it was a substantial amount of business. That which, is and that, to me, that was the precursor to all this e -com. You know, you didn't, you didn't have the, the internet back in the day, but we were installing uh, desktop computers at the operator's facility to help them do a self-service type order entry, which, you know, again, kind of predates the, the, the whole e-com explosion. Yeah, I'll, uh, you know, Chris, if you, you said some of you guys are old DSRs, they may remember this. This was, this was an old piece of our original marketing, right? This was what, our what if program. We had, a, we had a slogan that said, what if you could do one thing today that would make everything you do tomorrow more profitable? And, and then within that, we built our product platform. So we bundled, we had you know, the SPS link program, which was the laptop program. We had the VAS link program, which was the customer direct order entry. We had the ISS, yeah, ISS, which was inside sales. So the inside sales people were obviously a critical component and then the product information. And so our, our platform was always about putting all those together. And then of course, later in life, the internet came along and, and everything started to go online and we did that as well. But we, we always felt like the real key was everybody had to be on the same page. Everybody had to have access to the same information. They had to look the same, it had to feel the same, it had to be easily accessible. And, and so we always felt like the, the key to, to the success for our customers was bringing everybody onto that common platform and, and giving them the tools they needed when they needed it. You know, that's a really good point because even, even for my clients that are watching this, just think if like everyone, like everyone used the same item number. Cause right now it's like, <laughs> just for item numbers, it's the wild west. But if everyone had the same item number, like a UPC number, it's in con GTIN number, we'll talk about that later all the possibilities that would open and all the communications that would open between everyone. So yeah, having that, having that similarity between everything is like super, super important. I, I see big value with that. Yeah. Um, also too, for, for those that are watching this as well, um, NECS created, actually it's our most popular product, um, most popular add-on to our software. We call it the electronic order pad. Um, we call it EOP for short, and it, it does, uh, it's created for DSRs, it gives them all of that information, it runs on a, either an Apple iPad or um, an Android device, um, 
And again, it's like, it just has everything that the distributor would need, except a lot of the GS1 information that we're gonna, we're gonna be talking about. But these tools make it easier for everyone, for, for the, everyone from the restaurant to the DSR taking the order back in the, into the office, et cetera, just automating that whole process, eliminating mistakes, et cetera. So I'm gonna, like we were talking, or I was talking about maybe making this into two segments, but I'm just gonna start talking about GS1, and then we're gonna merge into what Attribytes is doing. But Ken, you have a lot of experience you know, working for One World Sync, GS1, Council, et cetera. For my clients that don't really know what GS1 is, or what a GTIN number is, or what a GDSN number is, is there anything that you would like to share as like uh, introductory information about what, what the GS1 represents? Yeah, I mean, I'll give them the, the, the two minute version, Chris. And there, there's, there's, the good news is there is a wealth of information on exactly those topics. It, it's all available on the internet. If you, if you go to the GS1 website, and I'm sure Attribytes has got the uh, stuff on theirs as well, but they, they have an extensive extensive library of educational materials there are tutorials there's reading materials so however you want to spend your time learning there is a wealth of information available but you know the the good news is the gs1 is an organization they're a standards-based organization they manage the standards and there are gs1 organizations throughout the globe and and kit probably is is even more uh, uh, proficient in this than I am, but I'll, I'll give you my version. There's there are m multiple GS1 organizations around the world that manage the standards, and then the GDSN, the Global Data Synchronization Network, is the the platform for exchanging that information within those standards uh, around the world. And the G10, the GTIN, or Global Trade Identification Number you mentioned, is exactly what you you talked about that, that common denominator number. It's the essentially the next generation UPC number. Uh, so it's it's much more complicated. It can contain a lot more information. But but that that whole network is is uh, is just a great way to to solve this problem or this need for information. Again, we we talked about the importance of standards. We talked about the importance of getting everybody on a common platform. And, and that, that is great to an extent. Now, you can't ever expect everybody's gonna use the same piece of software. You're never gonna have everybody on the same, you know, uh, software vendors and, and versions of software and so forth. And so the key is the underlying data content standards, right? The database being in a standardized format that the, uh, the content or the software providers can then work with and develop, and you're not gonna display all of the information that's in the GDN database. It's just too much content, uh, too, many, too many attributes, but you're gonna grab the ones that mean value to your customers. You're gonna display them in, in you know, a manner that your customers want to see them and, and where and when. You know, DSRs wanna see certain information, buyers wanna see something else. All that information gets maintained in the standard database, and then you extract it as you need it. Uh, it's just a, it's a great platform. It's, it's come a long way, but it's still got, you know, a, a long way to go. So uh, we're really glad that companies like yours are, are jumping on board and helping your customers get access to it. And certainly after Bites and Kit and his team have done a great job. Awesome. Awesome. So, so Kit, what can you add to that for an NECS client that's just like really starting to discover the importance of what, what GS1 does? What, what are the benefits? Yeah, well, so just to kind of expand on what Ken said, um, and he framed it up very, very nicely, GS1 is that governing body, and, and they kind of create the sandbox, the standards, and they do that by geographic region. Uh, they also do that by vertical. So there's somewhat different standards for food service as opposed to retail, as opposed to hard lines, which would be, you know, uh, tools and things of that nature. Um, and then the data pools, which make up the GDSN kind of help the exchange of that content. And the best analogy I have for all of that would be the cellular networks. So there is interoperability for all data pools. So as, a, as one of your customers doesn't need to join more than one, when they select a data pool, and that can be based on uh, comfort with that company, price, the best tools, whoever they select can receive content from any other data pool out there. Just like, you know, the difference in I'm on Verizon, 
my wife's on AT and T. Uh, when she first got started, uh, she wanted to join the cellular network. She was enamored with the iPhone. Way back in the day, AT and T was the only company that had had iPhones. Me, I was a traveling salesman working for Ken. I was going all over the country. I just needed the best coverage I could get. And so I went with, with Verizon. She went with AT and T. All of her monies go to AT and T. My monies go to Verizon, but we can still pick up the phone and have a conversation with each other freely and have that communication. The data pools are the same way. So if, if one of your customers happens to be on my data pool and one of their manufacturers, let's say Kraft, is on a different data pool, Kraft can still send that content into your customer through my network. And it really helps so that there's not a lot of uh, duplication in spending. Um, Again, it makes it more up to that that particular uh, customer to pick and choose what makes the most sense for them. Okay, so you just used the word content. What what exactly is the content that someone gets when, when they're retrieving this, this information from the GS1? Well, to Ken's point, there's probably 500 to 600 different unique attributes that are available at the item level. Um, now, most folks are going to focus on the marketing fields, uh, which we have about four or five features, benefits, serving suggestions, prep and cooking, um, allergen type data, um, nutritional claims, is this a gluten free item, um, a complete nutritional fact panel, um, imagery, digital assets, uh, some of the new digital assets that are being made available through the GDSN are, are things like uh, product formulation sheets. Uh, meal equivalencies for the schools so that you can see, you know, how much um, proteins this uh, particular chicken breast might might provide to that kid. Um, and that's continuing to grow and grow as well. Um, that's probably the, in, including video. Uh, you can in, incorporate video into the data feed. So it's, um, you know, it's really up to the, the manufacturer what they want to present. And then also on the users. Uh, some of the things that we were doing way back in the day at SPS, we had a product called Recipe Pro. Um, and the design of that program from a DSR's perspective would be that they could provide a food cost percentage, they could break things down more so by the hamburger patty or the bun and kind of divert the customer's um, view off of the, the case price, but look at it more at a, at a per piece uh, type deal. But in addition, you could actually create a complete plate presentation and a nutritional fact panel on that plate presentation by having the nutritionals tied to that same quantity. And so there's been a big push of late. In fact, one of our more recent customers is really strong on this, and that is making sure that they're providing the 100 gram nutritionals so that you can easily break that down into the specific components and then create that nutrition fact panel on the fly, depending upon whatever uh, ingredients you might include in that recipe. That's uh, that. That's really, that's a lot of inform information for everyone, for the DSR, for the end user, et cetera. Ken, is there hey, anything? Hey, Chris. Yeah, go ahead. I give you just to add to what Kit said. I'll give you your DSRs. May appreciate this as well. Just a, a little bit of history on this thing is that you know we our original Kit mentioned the GS1 standards vary by geographic region and also by industry, and when the GS1 initiative launched in food service. Uh, we literally, I was on the committee that, that uh, helped develop the GS1 standards for food service. There were about 60 of us, so it was a big group. But we had representatives from all over the industry, and we worked uh, for a long time to come up with the additional attributes that they needed to add to the standards in order to meet the, the needs of food service. And we literally took the, the profile database field by field, along with a couple other f sources of content, and laid them out side by side, and, and we went through those. So if you if you follow the the, the the chain profile, you go if we go back to the beginning of SPS, we launched our original database was XPD. We we donated the format of XPD to the public domain in 1996 when we launched it as profile, and we partnered with the industry to launch profile as an industry standard. Then we took profile and laid that on the table against the GS1 standards. So when the GS1 food service standards were were, were uh, created those data attributes were built into that as well. And, and then that's obviously continued to morph. So it's, uh, it's come a long way, but its roots are still in, 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 certainly in the food service industry, the roots are in the core content that we started with clear back in the eighties. And it's, uh, it's a variety of attributes. It's grown tremendously. 
but it, it still comes down to who the user is, what information they need, and how they need it, right? Buyers need certain information to buy effectively. Salespeople need different information to sell effectively. The logistics and operations need different fields. Healthcare accounts need more health, health uh, and uh, nutritional information. Restaurants need more food cost and, and marketing attributes. So it's, it's, it's really it's the ability of the standards to be tailored to the user is, a, is a, what makes it so powerful. Kit, were you going to add something to that as well? No, it, he, he, he summed it up very, very nicely. It, it's just, it's been interesting to me just to see that evolution though. Um, and I remember being in the, the food service initiative meeting there, you know, Ken mentioned six, actually I think there was like a hundred people um, in that initial meeting where everybody was asked to stand up and say, will you support this moving forward? Um, and it was just very, you know, from the Cisco's to the U S foods trickling on down to like L and B Leggett's and Tyson's and, PepsiCo's, um, but all moving forward. Um, the other interesting thing, too, is I think the GDSN prior to the Food Service Initiative had really been driven in large part by the, the large retailers like a Walmart. And their main objective was really to understand better case dimensions, pallet configurations, so that they could then more efficiently transport box from A to B. Um, when the Food Service Initiative started, you know, we food service didn't have the opportunity to walk up and down a grocery store aisle, grab a box, look at pictures, see the nutritionals on the side. You know, we deal in brown boxes. And so the need for all of this, this marketing information, the digital assets and the imagery, um, that really shot to the forefront, that, to Ken's point, so the DSRs had what they needed when they were out in the field. Um, but as, as retail started seeing what we were doing over in food service, they were like, hmm, I need some of that too. We have an e-com site. We need pictures. And, and it's been very interesting to see almost a blending of attribution from food service to retail. You know, and that, I think in the last couple of iterations, while there is some, some um, uniqueness, that's now all communicated on a single spreadsheet versus it used to be two whole separate groups and two whole separate sets of work groups as well. I mean, yeah, exactly. Like, can you imagine going to a place like um, Amazon.com and buying something without a photo? Like, like we just depend on getting all of this information all the time. So without, it's, it's, it's so important. So for, for a food service distributor that's watching this, that uh, may be an NECS client, may not be an NECS client, they might be saying, oh, my buying group is offering this to me. I maybe should get involved there. Um, or I'm... I'm part of, I buy from Dot Foods, for example, and I can get information from, from them as well. What, right, right now, what are the options that a food service distributor has to get this information? Do they contact the GS1? They, just explain how the data pools work and idea of what costs would be, um, just so that, like, because I, I think some of our watchers are, are thinking about, wow, I really need this, but where can I get it and how much is it going to cost me? So... Well, to your point, um, and, and I think this is because Atrobytes is a food service organization. So, you know, everybody within the company came through food service. Um, you know, I've been in this space since, since 96, um, and everybody else in our organization has as well. We've been very, very fortunate on the buying group side. So we, we have relationships with the main buying groups out there, and all of them do have uh, programs as you described so that they've already been collecting product information and that can be leveraged to their members so that the members can get a jump start. That is one thing that's important to note is that the GDSN is a publication subscription type model. So typically a food service distributor would get started, they would select their data pool um, you know, based on whatever makes the most sense for them uh, and then they would send out campaign services to their supplier base and say, hey, I'm on the network, please publish all of your product information to me. Those organizations that, that are larger, that have a greater um, uh, purchasing power, not that the suppliers don't want to provide it, but if you're not, you know, if you're 10% of their annual sales, they're gonna spend a lot more time uh, satisfying your request than if 
you know, maybe you're one percent or a half a percent. And so um, the buying group stepping out in front and, and getting engaged and starting to collect content can really help a lot of their membership that, that might not uh, feel comfortable standing on their own. Um, but by that same token, we have a whole team of, of uh, inside sales folks that reach out, uh, have conversations with the manufacturers, explain how to do things, explain how to get the information to a particular company. So in this day and age, any organization, no matter how small, can certainly uh, get active and can certainly start getting publications and product information sent down. It's, it's, typically, not, um, it's typically not a challenge of getting the suppliers to work p potentially as much as it might be working with that, that distributor and making sure their internal data um, is even able to make sense of it. So, for example, you mentioned the G10s. That is that common code. Um, if a distributor doesn't have a G10 or doesn't have any G10s or UPC codes within their system, often it, it, it takes a manual intervention to create that one-time link between the item in their um, item master file and that inbound publication. And so as a company, we've spent a lot of time trying to develop tools and mapping services that can kind of bring those links together and give that distributor the opportunity to log in and take a look at that and then accept that match, which would then generate the file down into their system with the cleansed content and all the um, additional information that's provided by the manufacturer. Cool. Ken, did you want to add to that at all? Well, I was just going to say that's where companies like you really, really come into play, Chris. You, you have the ability to make this data easily available to your customers, right? And, and that's, where, that's where it all starts. The, the number one question I always got from distributors was, why can't I get more information from manufacturers? And the number one question we always got from manufacturers was, why aren't more distributors using my information? And so to, to bridge that gap, software providers have to provide the tools. And so the, the data standards are there and certainly companies like Kit, you know, play a large part in this as well. But, but you with, with your client base in the distribution market, making the integration points to where this information is easily available to your customers in a format that they can use and, and then educating them. And again, you know, this is where partnerships come into play is your customers, big and small, just need to ask their manufacturing partners to provide them with this information. And, and I, you know, when you ask a manufacturer, and I don't care if you're, you know, a $5 million distributor or, or you know, a $500 million distributor, you obviously carry a bigger stick with the volume. When you tell a manufacturer, I want more information on your products so that I can sell more of your products. That manufacturer, uh, if they're worth anything, is going to find a way to do that. And, and, and more than likely, they, you know, they've got a, a process in place already with the GS1 standards to do it. And so it's really an educational process. It's, it's asking for the information. And then it's companies like yours, you know, giving them the tools so they can access it and use it. Yeah, because one of the things that I definitely see, the direction that, that we're going in is to actually have all of that information integrated into our client's inventory master file. And now that information be able to flow out into their the tool that the DSR would use, such as our electronic order pad product, or if a client's logging on via the web to place an order, all that information could be available to them as well, you know, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it flows out and that consistency is there. I, I don't know how many um, software companies like NECS in this space actually have made the efforts to have like a full integration into their, or our, our software is considered ERP software, um, to have a full integration. Are you guys aware of any company that, that have already done that? Well, I think, I think there are a lot of companies that have hooks into the system. Um, and that's been some of the things that, that that's been one of my drivers. Um, you know, again, you can, you, you can tell I, I was trained a lot by Ken, but I saw that as an early, opportunity as soon as I got into this space is I needed to make sure every software company could at least use something. Um, but a full integration as you described, like I don't see that quite as often. Uh, a lot of times the data will get uh, connected into let's say um, a CRM tool. So maybe a cell sheet shows up for the DSR. But then if you look at the warehouse management solution, 
is they don't necessarily take advantage of all the logistical data that comes across to the GDSN within those applications or the truck loading uh, applications. I think there's a lot of um, other areas within the business that the content could certainly be used. Um, now, I'm again, I'm happy, I'm, I'm thrilled when I see it show up in the client-facing solutions and I see it show up in the e-com type solutions. I'm thrilled with that. I just think there's other benefits that distributors could get from it if they use it in other places. Like, as you were saying that, I was remembering that on some of the items it actually shows the outside of the box that the, that the products are packed into so that that could be useful for the warehouse staff as well to make sure that they, they pick the right product. There was a lot of work um, in those early days of the initiative around imagery and coming up with what are all the pictures that we need to have, what are the types of pictures we need to have, um, how can we c create an effective naming convention that could allow some systematic reading of those images and place them in the locations they need to go. Uh, for example, like a beauty shot, you might want that on the, the cell sheet. Um, but yet, we did find through that research that a lot of the operators actually wanted to see what the case looked like and maybe open the case and just take a picture of the open case as well just to see what that was going to look like as opposed to, you know, a beauty shot with, you know, a, a, nice, a, a nice plate presentation or something like that. They wanted to get more granular and actually see the product as it might arrive or see it in a raw state that they might uh, begin to prepare it. Yeah, that, that makes sense. Ken, is there anything you wanted to add to that? Well, just uh, continuing on, right? There is no such thing as an end to this conversation, right? The, the <laughs> amount of data that people want is more, right? Every, every time you give them content, they want more content. And, and you know, I've, I've been having this conversation literally since 1988. And so, you know, it, it is an ongoing discussion. And, and the more we know, the more we want to know. And, and nowadays with the, with the easy access to information, there should be no such thing as an unanswered question. So people want to know un, unlimited amounts of information. And so, you know, pictures have come certainly because of the data storage issues, pictures have become very common, but pictures of the pot, of the box, of the inside of the box, of the, the sub packs and the sub packs of the sub packs and the plated product and recipe information. And, you know, then, then you get into the nutritional information, then you get into the USDA and they have a whole other definition of nutritional information. So it's, it's just unlimited. And so it can become overwhelming and that's the challenge, right? It could be on so much that, that you get, you just freeze. And it's like, oh my gosh, I, I, there's no way I, I can, I can do this. And so you have to take it in pieces. You have to find good partners that can help you manage the content that you can, you can integrate with and educate your customers and then do it in steps, right? Take pieces that are most important to your customers, get them integrated, get them to the right point, and then go to the next step. Uh, because it, again, by the time you start giving this to your customers, they're going to, they're going to want more. And that's a great thing, but you got to get started. You know, we used to talk about getting on the bus, right? That was the old technology story. If you're standing at the bus stop and your bus pulls up and just before you get on, you look behind that bus and there's another bus and it's a little bit nicer and it's got fancy windows and leather seats. So you think I'm not going to get on this bus. I'll wait for the next one. So that bus pulls away and the next bus pulls up. And just before you step on another bus pulls up and this one's got air conditioning. So you think I'm going to wait and I'm going to get on the next bus and that'll go on forever. And so at some point you got to get on the bus and you know, then you'll get to where you want to go. So it's, it's, it's a, it's a great project, but it can be uh, it'll be a large, large project, but a lot of work. So um, there'll be a lot of work for, well, Ken, you're retired now, but for Kit and myself, we've got, we've got a, lots of stuff to do. <laughs> the future. That, that's um, why I love talking about this stuff now, because I don't have to do any of the work anymore. <laughs> yeah, exactly. exactly. Um, I just wanted to like have you guys just make clear one thing too. We, we talked about the GTIN number, the global trade item number, which I think is really important. We actually have it in our software right now. And one of our apps we call the electronic warehouse manager, when they're scanning products, it does this look up. And if the GTIN end number is not currently in their inventory master, it adds it for them automatically. But there's another number called the GDSN number. Um, GSD number. Yeah, GS, the, the GSDN number. I think you're thinking of a GLN. GLN, yeah. The, G, the GLN number, okay. Yeah. Um, what does the GLN number 
represent and why is that important? Well, so like the G10 represents the item. The, G, the, the GLN represents the physical location. That's a global location number. And that number, that numeric value is what gets tied to the data pool and what, if you are a recipient or a distributor, that is the number that a company like a Tyson would set up in their system to publish their content to you. So that's, it's all driven by these unique numbers. Um, and in fact, you know, another number they might hear is a company prefix. And so that's kind of what organizations purchase to create G10s, uh, but that's also a number that, that is used to create that GLN uh, to identify you on the network. Okay, so if I am a distributor and I have a warehouse location and I've got all of my clients that I sell to, does each client also have a number that represents their location where the product ended up at? They can. And there are certain operators that have done that from a traceability perspective. Um, I believe Subway. They have every single restaurant in the, in the country identified with a GLN uh, so that if if a, there is a particular recall, and they've also forced their supply chain to do scanning on inbound as well as outbound, they can surgically remove that item. They can know specifically what stores within their entire supply chain have a particular product delivered, and they can surgically remove that. And I think that's another really, really important thing. I remember you know, a part of that, those early GS1 meetings, um, John Martin with Martin Brothers was a big driver of this whole thing. And he had just a really funny way about himself explaining things. And he, as he's talking through this whole thing, he started talking about a recall. And he's like, I spent six weeks, 600 man hours looking for peanut butter. For peanut butter. And you would think, you know, they could find where they put that product. But because of the way the data was back in those days, that was their only option. They had to pull out every bit of peanut butter they had ever sold to anybody in the organization through a certain time frame. And, and having this extra layer of identification certainly helps you to gain efficiencies in a lot of other areas. Yeah, because um, uh, another big topic that people are talking about or have been talking about for a while is food traceability and using blockchain. And, you know, exactly, if there is just one out of a thousand cases of peanut butter, if there were only four that were contaminated, why are we returning a thousand cases? We should just be able to find those four. So my thought was that eventually each location that a distributor sells to should have their location, just like what Subway is doing, to have that complete uh, traceability. Ken, do you have any Absolutely. insights about that? Yeah, I, I think that's great. I, I, I grabbed this out of my file. Kit was talking about John Martin. Just so happens I, I have an old reprint of uh, John Martin. Martin Brothers was Innovator of the Year in 1998 for just those kind of thoughts, right? Oh, so wow. This was a, a reprint of an old SPS ad we did to congratulate them. But there were some, there were some real innovators involved early on in this, this whole process. But uh, again, traceability, trackability is a, is a key strategy of the whole GS1 standards. And uh, it's come a long way. Food service has got a long way to go. Uh, as Kit talked about the GLN at the operator side, uh, that's, that's a lot stronger in the healthcare, hospitals, and, and, and that, that field in particular. Schools maybe have come a long way, but restaurant level, there's so much independent in the restaurant industry. The chains certainly can, can get there. The independents have a lot of work to do. So the GLN in the, in the, uh, to the operator level is still very much a work in progress. But uh, just anything from the distributor side, certainly dot foods, you know, and the distributors that have multiple warehouses, multiple locations, from a traceability, trackability standpoint, and food safety, uh, it's, it's almost imperative. That makes sense. Um, there's also other concepts on the other side of it. I know one of the things that NECS got involved with very heavily uh, that was government mandated was um, the COOL requirements, C-O-O-L, country of origin labeling. So for example, if you were to buy prime rib from someplace that you would know, oh, this is from uh, beef cattle from Argentina or Canada or China, wherever it was coming from, to give the consumer 
an idea of where that product came from. So I think that as the world evolves and changes and we want to know more about what we're putting into our bodies, I think all these things are just going to start kind of bubbling to the surface a little bit because people are going to start to, to, to demand to know certain things that maybe they haven't been as insistent as before. And we just want to be, be ready for that phenomenon when it happens. And yeah, that's great, Chris. I, you know, the, the, the country of origin is certainly important. And also within the country, I mean, we have a huge push in the food service space for, for locally grown, right? I want to buy products that come from my area of the country. And so there are custom fields and the standards that allow you to, to identify those things. So, you know, I, I want to know certainly country of origin, but I also want to know if this stuff was grown in, in my home state or my home, you know, backyard. So that kind of information is, is, is uh, it's, just again, it's it's unlimited what you could add, but it you know it's what what means the most to your customers and their users. Yeah, exactly. The whole the whole rise of the farmers market phenomena, etc. Uh, farm to uh, fork to farm tra traceability. Kit, what, what were you going to add to this? Well, it, it's just inter interesting that in some of those work groups, because we still have you know food service industry work groups around GS one, we we kind of devolve. Uh, in, into some of those discussions about how crazy those requests might be to the fact that they might want to know physically where the cow is that they got their milk for their breakfast so they can go by and pet the cow and tell them what a wonderful cow it is and how thankful they are for having the milk and you know even with the you know chickens or the eggs maybe they want to go by and see the coop because make sure the coop is a nice clean coop and that chicken was very well cared for I mean um, there's a the, the, the amount of content that could be shared, um, we, while we laugh at those things, it could be there someday. You're, you know, you really could have that, and we're continually adding to the standard uh, for things like sustainability, local, locally grown, um, just to satisfy those consumer needs. Yeah, that's, that's really good. I think that's really important. It's really important for the future as uh, consumers start to change a little bit and become a little bit more um, uh, critical of what, you know, what's, what they're consuming. Yeah, one of the ways to look at it, Chris, just, just if I could add, the, yes. you know, we used to tell the story about how the people's, people's needs have changed. And we said your grandparents bought products based on availability. If they could find it, if it was available, they could buy it. You know, our parents were very brand conscious. They bought based on brand loyalty and brand marketing and brand IDs. And then, you know, our generation came along and we started to want to know more about content, what's in it, how is it made. And now this, this new upcoming generation has taken that to an all new level. They want to know not only where's the product made, but who made it. I want to know, is your company sustainable? Does the company that makes this product treat the planet properly? Are you good? Do you treat your employees well? Are you using the right ingredients? Are you making decisions that are good for the future of our planet and our people? It, it, it's just unlimited the amount of information people are now looking at. And who knows what the next generation is going to want but it's, a, it's an ever-evolving demand. Yeah, one, one of the topics that came up is um, some people that I was hearing about were, they wanted to know if their meat was, that the meat they were purchasing was from a cloned animal or not. And it's not to say they weren't for it or against it, but they just wanted to know, is this a clone or is this like a, a, a regular bred um, a cow or chicken or whatever it is. So, and then to add to that as well, here at my company at NECS, um, I had, as a, as a company project, um, I had everyone watch this documentary film called Food Inc. It's, it's older, it was made in 2009, but it's still pretty relevant. But, you know, because we're in this industry, I, I felt that we all had a need to understand what was going on. And I would say almost everyone at my, at my company here, you know, 40 plus people, had no idea. And they, and they were concerned and they wanted to know more about it. It got them more interested in what's happening in the food supply chain as well. So with that said, I want to, I want to know more about Kit's company, Atrobytes. Like what, what is Atrobytes? And some of my clients may have already been approached by you, Kit. You might already be talking to some of them, but for those that aren't, um, tell us a little bit about Atrobytes. I know you have some slides. We can attempt to show them um, as you speak. If you share the screen or we can, we'll edit them in later. But tell us about Atrobytes. Well, so love to. Um, and 
Attributes is really the, the brainchild of our CEO, Mike Kavark, and it kind of started when he was, and I met Mike when he was at U.S. Food Service. They were a client of mine, and he was kind of running uh, a 30-person temp team, and they were managing all of the content that were, they were receiving from the GDSN through that team. And Mike had an opportunity to, to change roles, and so he left U.S. Food Service and went to Shamrock, and he went from a team of 30 to a team of one. <laughs> and all of the tools that he used to have at his disposal were gone. And, and he needed extra things. He needed more information and more granularity on the items that they were currently selling in, in his role as a merchandiser. And so the very first foray we had was an application called View My Product. And View My Product, to me, it kind of wraps around the GDSN. Um, it's not, it, we weren't a data pool at that point in time, but we could wrap around the GDSN, provide additional granularity on certain items, uh, such as, you know, my cheese is cheddar, my cheese is round, my cheese has uh, 16 slices. Um, but further descriptors on, the, on the, the item itself, which could potentially be in the GDSN, but it's not fielded out that way, and so it would re require a little bit more effort. In addition, there was opportunities to create scorecards and score the data um, that was in the distributor system that had been provided by the manufacturer. Um, now, there's a bit of uniqueness to that in that when this first started, many manufacturers would call and they'd kind of get upset and they're like, look, I know my data is perfect in my data pool, yet I'm getting the scorecard that's not really that great. Well, the, the View My Product application doesn't score the data based on an inbound transaction. It actually scores the data based on what that distributor has received and consumed, which is a very different look at that. And in certain cases, we might find that maybe that manufacturer was populating this marketing field, but the distributor was consuming this marketing field. And so there's some opportunities there to uh, populate more fields on the GDS inside. Um, or have a conversation with the distributor, maybe have them consume a different different attribute on the inbound side. Um, also related to the imagery, the notion of giving that supplier the ability to log in, see what images that distributor had on their specific products, and even give them the ability to resort those images based on what the specific need was. So if the distributor was showing the very first image was a closed case, the very next image next to it was just a different angle of that closed case. Now that, op, that uh, supplier or manufacturer get in there and actually rearrange those so the beauty shot showed up at the front side, next case right next to it, then the open case shot, so on and so forth, to kind of improve that overall data quality. Since we were doing that for quite a while, um, many of the suppliers who were getting in and using our application, they kind of said, why aren't you guys doing a data pool too. So, I mean, we like working with you. We like working with your team. Um, you're very helpful. It's easy to work with. You seem to understand the business a little bit. And so that was what we did. So based on customer demand and the supplier community, we, we decided to go ahead and move forward and become a fully certified GDS and data pool. Um, and we've kind of filled that role within the food service space as the food service data pool. Uh, in fact, we are the fastest growing data pool worldwide. Uh, based on number of GLNs that have been tied to our system, both on the recipient side as well as the source side. Um, I mentioned earlier we've been very, very fortunate to, to be able to earn the business of the, the major buying groups in food service. Um, we've been able to develop these programs that, again, allow some of these buying groups that might have 350,000 items that they've already gotten published into them that could be shared in, uh, with their member membership so that those members you know, if they want to get started in this process, they can jump in, have data right away to start working with, um, and then get that content out to their uh, DSRs and their operators pretty, pretty quickly. Um, now, that's one other thing, too, that I definitely want to say. You know, that one of the first questions we always get um, within this type of a project is, how long will it take? When will I be done? Well, it's, you're never done. And I, I don't mean that in any kind of a negative light, but that's, it's always an ongoing process. You're always looking to improve your content. You, you always, as a distributor, bring in new items. 
manufacturers are always launching new products, so there's always going to be this this process. Um, but we can get you up and running pretty pretty darn quick and get data flowing pretty quick as well. Um, once we had the the GDSN data pool, we kind of started to branch out a little bit more. Um, all things related to content and products. Um, so we also started doing document management related to potential vendor documentation that might need to be stored and managed at the distributor level. Um, another easy tie-on was, was rebate solutions, uh, price management, things of that nature. Um, and, and in today's environment, we're also doing virtual food shows. Um, easy to prop those kind of things up in a very cost-effective way since we already have all the content coming from the suppliers and can actually create you know a legitimate booth experience with a, a variety of items that all have you know digital assets marketing information nutritional information uh, the kind of details that, that uh, would be necessary to, to have a purchasing conversation that is all really um, interesting information I'm going to make sure that Everyone watching this has access to get contact you directly, Kit, and get your the website for Attribytes. Atri Same thing with you. Ken, I know you're retired, but I don't know if you would take questions from people if they asked you. <laughs> uh, sure. I'm, I'm, uh, I'm easy to find. Kit knows how to get a hold of me. I, I, uh, I, I, I guess I should explain the reason I'm on the call, Chris. I, you know, I, at SPS, we always thought very highly of you and your company as well. We, we, we really enjoyed uh, during our time watching you build your company as well. And Kit and I have been friends for 25 plus years. We go way, way, way back. And I know Kit doesn't look old enough, but he's literally been doing this for 25 years. And he, he has a wealth of knowledge that, that I know he can help you guys with. Um, but we, we started out, SPS, our philosophy and our strategy was very simple. It was people, process, and technology. We started by understanding the people, the person that's going to use the tools, the processes that they go through, and then how do you improve that with technology. And, and that's how we built our company for 20 years. And, and we're very proud of the fact that people always came first. And uh, they still do today, even though we're all, most of the senior, all of the senior management is retired. We're all still friends. We all still get together pre-quarantine. We get together regularly with our wives for dinner and uh, travel. We have occasional SPS reunions. We're, we're, we're all about the people at, at our organization and our customers. And uh, Kit is the same way. And I, I know you're the same way with your business as well, Chris. And so that's the reason I uh, came out of retirement for a couple of hours to be part of this call. <laughs> but uh, okay. sure, I, you know, I, I know a few things, uh, certainly, you know, Kit is probably up more up to date, but I'm happy to help wherever I can because it's it's good for the industry. I, I appreciate that. So if someone does reach out to you, they have to realize you're in retirement. There could be a delay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'll respond, but they might hear waves running in the background. You could hear the ocean in the background, but that's okay. All right, that's that's cool. And you guys really, I mean, SPS legends, legendary in the food, in the in the history of food distribution software. So I owe, I owe a lot to you guys. You really made some really super important headways, and I like how you put the people first, because as I know, as software developers, we can I can sit here with my team and we can come up with all these like interesting ideas that just are useless because it's not the people in the field so much that are using it. You really need to have that input. So I'm going to, I'm going to ask both of you a question in, in conclusion. Um, Ken, I'll start with you. I'll put you in the hot seat first. Where do you see things in five years from now related to the, to the GS one and the future of food distribution software? If you were to like look into your crystal ball, what do you think? What What do you think will be in about five years from now? Uh, Where would you like be, us to be? <laughs> yeah, I hope we're much farther down the path. I, I think to to me, Chris, the the exciting part now is about the connection between the people and the technology, right? The ever the ever evolving touch point of people to the technology, and it's gone from the old keystrokes of DOS to mouse clicks of Windows. To, to now, you know, voice recognition technology and so forth. I, I, that's, that's it. I, artificial intelligence and, and, and the ease of use of the technology is where I see the big exciting things over the next five years I, I, and beyond. But I think it becomes, we have so much available to us. There's so much information. There are so many tools out there that can help us. And, and yet, 
we don't have time to learn how to use them all, right? Who has time to go to school to learn how to use all the all of the you know how much of your uh, Microsoft Word program do you use? You probably use 10% of the of the capability, and so we got to find easy ways for people to use the tools that are available. And so I, I'm excited. I'm, I'm not part of it anymore, other than being a user. But I love to watch this thing evolve. I think it's going to be exciting to see how you know usability and artificial intelligence and, and, and the, the connection between the people and the technology continues to evolve. And and it's going to get better because. You know, guys like us, we're, we're what I call you know, technology immigrants, right? We learned how to use technology throughout our life because it's kind of grown along with us. The next generation, they're technology natives. They don't know any other way. They, they, don't, they wouldn't know what a phone book was if you gave it to them. So they only know technology as to, as to how they live. And so those people are going to just be light years ahead of us as far as rapid development. So it's going to be fun to watch. And I'll enjoy watching it from my uh, seat at the beach. Yeah, right. <laughs> Very well said. I know I have a, I have an eight year old and a twelve year old boy, and I tell them about some things from the past, and they're like, "Daddy used to do that." Like their cell phones were this big, and they had these big antennas, and yeah. So things are advancing, and AI is going to be part of that as well. Yeah, absolutely. So, Kit, what about you? Where do you, where do you see things headed in five years in your in your in your best scenario? Well, I agree with everything that Ken said. I think if if I look at more specifics, I see more friction getting removed from processes, um, both at the manufacturer's side and maintaining and creating content, and then at the distributor side and getting that content in. You know, we, we talked earlier about the integration and, and um, the notion of fully embracing it and putting it at all points within the, the organization through your software tools. And I said that that doesn't happen 100% today, you know, but I see it going there. I see people leveraging this data set more and more often um, and related, you know, back to the, to the manufacturer side, you know, maybe two years ago, um, smaller organizations weren't even thinking about, you know, investing in a PIM system or product information management solution. Um, they, would, they, they would participate in the GDSN, but for them, it was probably going to be a combination of creating spreadsheets with um, some digital assets and sending that to their data pool and allowing that data pool to flow that out. More and more organizations are automating that and building that into their product um, uh, product management life cycle. So as they start to develop that product, they're starting to create the content to surround that product to help make it more marketable when they finally bring it to sale. And I feel like that's going to continue to grow so that when this idea is ready and this new product gets released, distributors will already have it. It won't even be a notion of, well, hey, let me ask my supplier to send me that. The, the product will already be out, already be across the network, and already be consumed by distributors, not just for sale that day, but for the ability to use that in a new item setup process. So that, that item starts its life fresh within that distributor's system clean, as opposed to somebody like a buyer or merchandiser having to fill out some new item form and manually key that content into their ERP system. Beautiful, beautiful. Hey, I want to I want to thank you guys for spending this time with me. And I'm sure I mean I found it informational. I'm sure my clients um, will find it informational as well. Kit Moore from Attribytes, thank you. Ken Yuntz, uh, retired but a, a rock star from the from the past and getting all these things going for us. Thank you. Uh, being one of the pioneers, really. I mean, a kid as well, but definitely you as well, Ken. So yeah. I, I, appreciate, I appreciate your efforts. Thanks, Chris. It's, uh, I enjoyed the call. Actually, it was fun to, to trade some stories with, with a couple of industry guys like you. And uh, I still tell you, I follow the news, so um, I'm still plugged into to the industry. So I'll be watching for exciting things from you guys. Cool. Awesome. Well, thank you, everyone, for watching. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Kit. Hey, thanks, and I really enjoyed it. Um, I've always enjoyed uh, spending some time with Ken. Um, I owe a lot to him. You know, he really shaped me as a as a young sales guy trying to learn how to do all this. Um, it, you know, it's, it's it's been enjoyable. Pleasure. Awesome. And there's there's more years to go. <laughs> oh yeah. All right, guys. <laughs> thanks, guys. Yeah, thank you thanks, very guys. much. Right. Bye bye.